let's take a look at the steps in One Way ANOVA. So in step one, you're going to define a lot of mu's for me, right? True average of something. And then in step two for the null, you're going to set them all equal to each other, all right? And the complement of all numbers being equal to each other is that at least two are different. They don't necessarily all need to be different from one another, but at least two of these don't equal each other. So that's your alternate. At least two of the group means are not equal. You got your alpha level will default to 5%. On free response questions, you don't have to write up your assumptions because especially that third one can be a little ambiguous in terms of how do we check it. But here are your assumptions when we're dealing with one-way ANOVA. Um, you need your observations are obtained independently and randomly from the populations defined by the factor levels. You need normality on each population and you need those populations to have a common variance. All right, you're gonna be on the F distribution we're going to run one way ANOVA. There are two degrees of freedom formulas, right? There's the between and within. And that also plays out in your test statistic. There's the mean squares between and the mean squares within. And that ratio comprises your F test statistic. And we're going to get these, all of these numbers from our calculator, right? And in a perfect world, this ratio would be one or pretty close to one, pending the null was true. So that's, that's the number that's usually somewhere close to being under the peak. You will use FCDF to get that p-value. All right, we've always been using a CDF. ANOVA is no exception to that rule. So we're gonna use FCDF to make that happen. Um, and your p-value will always be a number between zero and one as it's a probability, right? Capital P with some stuff in parentheses. And it's always letter, symbol, number. All right, you'll sketch a picture. This is your basic F distribution. Again, some of them look like hyperbolas, but this is a great um, basic graph for step 12. Well, it will always be a right-tailed test. This is close enough to what we would call a T-squared test, right? We have the T distribution in chapters nine and 10. Um, this is basically like T-squared. So we're only looking at right-tailed tests, label it the X-axis with the letter F. Right? One will be somewhere close to the peak, and then you shade to the right of that number you calculated in step 10. Give me your conclusion, right? Tell me whether you're going to reject or fail to reject, and then tell me whether or not you have sufficient evidence for the alternate, and make sure you use context. All right, so let's just take a look at our general guidelines for our hypothesis test, and then we're going to wrap this up. All right, so taking a look at our 13 steps now that we're in chapter 13, again, for step one, it's always defining a parameter and you're gonna be comparing two or more averages. You technically, with two averages or two groups, you could run an ANOVA instead of a two sample t-test. Uh, if you have three or more, you have to run ANOVA, but you're gonna be defining a bunch of mu's for me, all right? The null hypothesis will always be equality of the mean, so you have a bunch of equal signs. The alternate is going to be that at least two of the means are different from each other. And that might be a little bit hard to wrap your, your brain around at first, and it is initially, right? Because the complement to all of the null proportions being equal is not that they are all different, rather that they are not all equal. So there are a couple of other ways to state this. We can say that at least two of the means are different from each other, keeping in mind that many may be different from each other, but at least two are different. We could also say that at least one mean is not equal to another. Again, the alternate is not, is, excuse me, again, the alternate is that not all of the means are equal. Some may be equal, some may not, but they aren't all equal. So that's what we're trying to say in the alternate there. Give me the alpha level, default to 0.5, right? In chapter 13 only, you don't have to check those assumptions, but you're more than welcome to. Tell me that we're working with the F distribution, right? State in that distribution in step six. In step seven, you only have the one option. You're gonna be running one-way ANOVA. Again, there's something called a two-way ANOVA test, but we don't cover that in this class. And when you all major in stats, you're gonna learn about it and it's gonna be amazing. Um, for degrees of freedom, you have two different formulas that you have to keep track of. You've got the betweens and the withins, and your calculator will put those out for you. The, the test statistic in one-way ANOVA it's always this ratio of the mean squares between to the mean squares within, all right? And in step 10, you're just gonna plug in your numbers that you're gonna get from your calculator output. So for chapter 13, you're either gonna use our calculator output or a mini tab output to compute the value of the test statistic. 
but we'll, we'll get that from technology one way or the other. In step 11, you're gonna be computing that p-value. And we've been seeing this for quite a few chapters. P-value, it's a probability. It's gotta be a number between zero and one, right? It's the probability that if the null was true, what's the likelihood that what you're seeing in your experiment would actually happen? Is it just to chance, random variation, or is it evidence against the alternate? Now, to just summarize where we've been in the last few chapters, right? We've been running hypothesis tests since chapter nine. All right, to calculate the p-value, you're gonna need some sort of CDF function in your calculator. Every p-value calculation requires capital P with some parentheses, and in these parentheses, you should write a letter, a symbol, and a number, all right? So your letter options, again, proportion land, Z, mean land, T, more than th or three or more proportions, chi-squared, three or more averages, F. And based on this, right, if you have the Z or T, you'll, you'll decide less than or greater than. For chi-squared or F, it's always greater than, all right? And the number that you're gonna use is always the number you calculated in step 10. So for chapter 13, we're gonna use FCDF, and because our test statistics are constructed to always be positive, because any squared number in math is automatically positive, and we're looking at ratios of mean squares and sum squares, um, we will only ever be interested in the right tail of the distribution. So in other words, we'll only ever calculate a p-value for a greater than, or excuse me, using a greater than for our symbol. Okay. All right, in step 12, you're gonna draw me a picture of the situation, right? You're, you draw me a picture and tell me that you're either on the standard normal, if you're in proportion land, the t distribution for mean land, chi-squared, three or more proportions, f, three or more averages. Label your x-axis with z, t, chi-squared, or f, okay? And then the number you calculated in step 10 should show up along your x-axis. The proportion of area shaded in your picture should match the p-value you found in step 11. So if you've got a 50% p-value, you better shade 50% of your curve. 3% p-value, shade 3% of the area under your curve. And I've given you a few examples, and now we've actually gotten all of these graphs under our belt, right? Here's the standard normal curve. Here's the t-distribution. Here's the chi-squared distribution, here's the f distribution. And as degrees of freedom increase for both chi-squared and f, these graphs, while they start out initially as unimodal and skewed right, or actually technically they start out like a hyperbola that's skewed right, but they get closer and closer to looking like the bell curve. They converge towards the standard normal curve. All right, and then last but not least for step 13, make sure you summarize your your conclusion, right? Tell me what's happening. Tell me if you're going to reject or fail to reject the null and whether or not you have sufficient evidence for the alternate and make sure you include that context. All right, so with that guys, that's it. Congrats. You made it through 13 chapters. You rock. You're awesome. Thanks for putting up with me and my bad jokes as we went through this. All right, we're on to the final. All right, take care guys. Bye.